this is Ryan. Hello. We both work for a company called Instill, and uh, we're based out of Belfast in Northern Ireland, and uh, we do software development and consultancy these days entirely in TypeScript and in Kotlin. And uh, we've just used a minute to introduce ourselves, so we're down to 24. Ah! Okay, so uh, this was originally designed to be a 45 minute talk, and then we were told it was going to be a 25 minute talk, so we are going to be talking very, very, very quickly. Okay, uh, if our accent gives you problems, now is the perfect time to leave. With our apologies, sorry about that. Okay, so um, why do we need this talk? So Kotlin is an awesome, awesome language. It gives us unique features, but these features don't exist in reality. They don't exist within the JVM. Uh, they don't exist in Node.js and so on. So the compiler has to fake them for us. And initially, we don't care how this is done. But whenever you get into worrying about performance or interoperability or something like that, then you definitely do care about how they're done. But fortunately, nothing is ever hidden in software. You know, we always have the ability to decompile. Even when the code has been obfuscated, you know, we still have the ability to decompile. And that is built into IntelliJ, okay? So if you haven't played with this feature, definitely play with it. So you can take some Kotlin code and uh, you can see the resulting bytecode. And if looking at raw bytecode isn't your thing, then you can translate that back to Java, okay? And uh, this is something I always encourage whenever people are uh, using using a new language, if the new language does something in a strange way that you don't understand, well, decompile and recompile into your favorite language and see how it actually works. You know, uh, that's how I transition from Java to C Sharp. It's a great way of doing it, okay? So uh, these, these features, this functionality for decompiling is, a, is within IntelliJ, but you can also use Java P. Java P is the tool that has always been with the JDK, and it has the advantage of having a shed load of options. You know, there are lots and lots of options that come with Java P. So in certain circumstances, that's a better tool to, to use. Yeah. So we're going to be looking at three kinds of lies that get told to you in Kotlin. Number one, the easy stuff lies within the core language. You know, I'm sure a lot of you will have seen at least some of these before. Then lies told within suspended functions, and then and finally, lies told within Jetpack Compose. Okay, so let's make a start in. Ryan, would you like to do number one? I will. I'll do the first one. So let's talk about free functions. So uh, Kotlin, being sorry, Garth, being yeah. a decent language, allows you to define uh, free functions. So it allows you to just define functions bare like this. So this is a uh, simple. Uh, hello world sort of uh, Kotlin uh, program. Uh, unlike Java, which is an indecent language, uh, it doesn't let you do these free functions. So this is one of the things that we like about uh, about Kotlin. Um, and uh, if we were to decompile this, we would see that actually the Kotlin compiler lies to us um, because it converts those free functions into static functions inside a class. Uh, so it uses the name of the file to create a class behind the scenes and then injects these, these functions, these methods uh, statically behind the scenes. Uh, and then execute them forward. So what we're actually doing is we're seeing some of the benefits, some of the lies told by the compiler to make our life easier, um, but actually uh, it's kind of cutting corners and cheap. Yep, very good. So moving on, these are going to come at you very, very quickly as you may have worked out. Let's say we have some nested functions. So we do our hello world again, but now the print message is nested inside me. You know, so what's going to happen? Well, if we decompile, we can see that we have the main required by the JVM, the main that takes a string. Then we have the main we wrote, the main that takes nothing. And uh, that's calling this curious method here, main dollar print message. So because we nested print message within main, uh, the generated method will be called main dollar print message. And uh, that leads to an interesting question. Yeah, What happens if you have two functions with the same name, that both have a nested method called print message. Yeah. So you see here we've got two functions called demo, one that takes an int, one that takes a double. Both of them have a nested function called print message. Yeah. So it can't call them both demo dollar print message. So when I saw this, I expected it would be like a, my days of C, where we would we would have something like demo dollar big I for int dollar print message and demo dollar big D for double dollar print message. But whenever you actually decompile it, it's simpler than that. We just get demo dollar print message <laughs> and demo dollar print message hyphen zero, and the count just keeps going up. Yeah. So it's a it's a good example of do the simplest thing that could possibly work. You know, don't get cute when you don't have to. Okay. So primary constructors. Colton lets us write the constructor for a class in the class definition, so we don't have to do all of that uh, uh, duplication of code with uh, private variable name. 
Uh, this dot name equals name, and I constructed all that sort of definition. Um, but actually, behind the scenes, what's it actually doing? Well, it's actually writing the Java code for us. It is creating these private variables. It is creating a constructor for us, uh, and it is creating all of these getters and setters. So once again, um, Kotlin lies to us uh, and makes uh, our code that little bit shorter. Very good. Then extension methods. Uh, this is probably the lie that you would assume is the most complicated, but actually is the simplest. So you see here, we've got a person type, we're extending it with say hello. We've got the built-in string type, we're extending it with times, uh, we're using both at the bottom. So you would assume that this is some kind of really esoteric compiler hack, it's dead simple. The type that you're trying to extend becomes the first parameter. So if we are trying to extend the person type, uh, we're just going to get a static method that takes a person as the first parameter. If we are trying to extend the string type, we'll just get a static method that takes the string as the first parameter and so on, okay? So like all good conjuring tricks, it's very, very simple once you see the secret. Let's talk about destructuring. Uh, Kotlin, uh, another sort of nice thing that it steals from uh, languages like JavaScript and Python, uh, we can take an object and we can break it up into its constituent parts. So here, we're taking a person object and we're grabbing X and Y and we're setting X to be Lucy and Y to be 36. How does Kotlin do this? What magic does it perform um, uh, to do this? Well, actually, uh, the record, sorry, the, the, uh, the data class um, creates these component one, component two, component three, component four methods for us automatically. We can create these ourselves in our own classes if we want. Uh, and just by using these, uh, the order of declaration allows us then to kind of destructure the object. So once again, Kotlin doing magic on our behalf. Yes. You use the word record, but wash your Sorry. mouth out with soap and water. You know, so I apologize. <laughs> we're actually rehearsing this, and instead of saying data class, I said case class. And I said, must not say that in the day I'll get furniture thrown at me. You know, people will be flinging chairs. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, let's move on and look at uh, object declarations. So again, this frees us in Kotlin from needing to use the singleton pattern. As you know, we can just say object type, and only a single instance of that type will get created. But whenever we disassemble, you can just see that the compiler is doing the singleton pattern for us. So anybody ever have to do the singleton pattern at interview? Yay, lots of hands going up there. Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. So math is just a class. Inside there, we have a static final field called instance. And then we have the static initializer block, which is run whenever the class is loaded in. And if you look at the highlighted bytecode, you can see that we're creating a new, inst of its, a new instance of the type. We're running its angle brackets in it, which is what the constructor gets compiled into. And then we're storing the value into this static field. So it's just the singleton pattern being applied for us. Yep. Um, and then companion objects. So that's me again. Yeah. So, uh, Let's say we have employee, and then inside there we have a companion object. Um, in this case, we're using it to contain some factory functions. Well, it's kind of the singleton pattern again, but now it's employee that's doing the creation. So if you have a look at what's going on in here, the static final reference to the singleton object is inside the employee class, and then it's the thing that's creating an instance of the companion and setting the field. And of course, the default name, as you can see, is companion. But for the purposes of interoperability with Java and so on, you might want to give it a, another name, a better name. So in this case, what are we doing? Well, we've got factory functions for creating an employee. So let's call this thing employee factory. And then the same pattern is just applied all over again, except as you can see, the type is now called employee dollar employee factory. Yeah. And, uh, we're creating the instance and storing it in the static field as before. Let's talk about enumerations. So uh, enumerations in Kotlin, this is actually one of the situations where Kotlin tells a slightly smaller lie than Java does. Uh, Java doesn't require you to define the, the enum as a class, but actually what it is doing is behind the scenes, it's disguising a class as an enum. Um, but Kotlin actually makes that explicit. So it says you've got to say this is a class. Uh, and so Kotlin's actually lying a little bit less here. Um, and again, just behind the scenes, we've got an implementation of the Java line enum. Uh, we've got uh, static final fields of the uh, the types that we're wanting. And then we've got this array uh, of the thing, of the values that allows us to iterate through. Uh, so once again, uh, a nice little shortcut to make things a little bit easier for us. Okay. Very good. Then uh, the next one, delegated properties. So uh, 
this has come up in an awful lot of talks that we've seen so far. So we have the idea again of uh, a person, and uh, a person has a job, and uh, the job is of type string, but we're going to implement it using a logging delegate. And what on earth is that? Well, if we had time, we could go through the implementation in detail, but it's just this thing here, uh, which extends read write property, and uh, it's going to log whenever we try and access the, uh, the person's job. So how is this implemented? Again, very, very simply. The compiler just creates a field of type read write property called job dollar delegate. And then uh, it creates an instance of our logging delegate inside the constructor of the person. And then whenever we call get job, what do we do? Well, we retrieve the field job dollar delegate and we call its get value method. Dead simple. Whenever somebody tries to call set job, what do we do? Well, we retrieve the value in the field and we call the set value of the, uh, the job dollar delegate. So it's the oldest rule of computer science. A, 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 an extra layer of indirection solves any problem. Okay, so again, very, very simple once you see how it's actually implemented. And the last one? Okay, yes, last one. So let's talk about lambdas with receivers. So here we've got an example uh, of a function type, uh, an action. Uh, that takes a, a lambda that acts on the person object. Uh, and what that gives us is this nice feature here uh, where I can use the age member from the person class inside the lambda without having to specify this dot age or, or, or self dot age or whatever the kind of the variable it dot age. Um, and it would do much Python and using uh, self. Um, and then we can also print out this uh, and that's going to output uh, the type of the person. So we've got this kind of ability uh, to execute this lambda in the context uh, of this object. Um, so how does how does Cotton do this? Is this one of those things where again is, is it going to split open the person object and kind of inject this code? Uh, well, uh, no. Um, if you think about uh, remember the way that Java handles um, uh, lambdas, uh, it's got a function interface, um, and we're doing exactly the same thing here. Um, very similar to the kind of extension method type concept. Um, so what we've actually got is we've got an implementation of a, a function one type. Uh, for our person, uh, and the person is the first argument to it. Uh, so this lambda uh, is converted into an object of this type, of this function one type. Uh, and uh, the first argument is the thing that it acts, that the receiver uh, is passed into it. Uh, and then we're just calling it down below here uh, to kind of uh, make that, uh, that implementation. Uh, and there's uh, something funny about the way that this works. We're just calling invoke on it here as an example. Um, I can extend that out. Um, with multiple arguments. So if my lambda takes two arguments here, um, I can call it, uh, I get a, a function three, uh, which has got P1, P2, P3. Uh, I can keep going and keep going uh, up to the magic number, which is uh, 22. Uh, so I can do 21 plus one um, uh, lambdas if I want. Sorry, so I've got a, a lambda with receiver um, and uh, 21 arguments to it. Please don't do this. Uh, this is bad <laughs> Um, but, but if you want to do this, we will be making a repo public yeah. with all this sample code. So this, this is perfectly legal. Uh, you can do this, and uh, Kotlin will support it quite nicely um, with the function 22. Um, where's my source code? There we are there. Function 22.invoke, uh, perfectly magic. Uh, I do not know why they picked 22, um, but uh, 22 is the number. Uh, so let's break it. Uh, what happens if I if I have 22 arguments to my lambda? Um, because I like to live on the edge. Um, uh, so here's my, my super function. I think in Ireland we would say at this point, wind your neck in uh, and don't do this, but uh, we'll, we'll just do it anyway. Um, and we'll implement this code uh, and we'll execute it. And what we see uh, is that we've got this thing of type function n. Uh, so for 23 arguments and up, uh, it converts it into a var args obje object and then passes that to this function n thing up to, I think, 44. I think I've got 44 in my head, maybe 42. Um, 42 plus one or something, something, something like that. So, so they're, they're, yeah, but seriously, don't do it. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not wise. Uh, yep. Very good. So looking at time, I think we've got 10 minutes left, is it? Okay. So we've got five minutes on each of these topics. So, <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, <laughs> let, let's write some code. Okay. So let's talk about suspending functions. So normally we would have a big demo where we build this up and we have that client code and server code and it'll all be in the repo and all that kind of thing. But all you care about is we've got a suspending function called order breakfast. And it calls a suspending function that orders the beverage, and then another suspending function that orders the food, and then it builds and returns the breakfast. That's all we care about, okay? The suspending function order breakfast uh, uses order beverage and order food to build your beverage. So, uh, sorry, build your breakfast. So let's say we, de um, we decompile order breakfast. What do we get? 
we get a switch statement inside a label, okay? So if you remember only one thing about suspending functions, suspending functions are implemented using a switch statement uh, within a, uh, a label. That's all it is, okay? It is a very, very simple conjuring trick that can get really, really complicated, okay? So here's a little flavor of the code. Um, you see here, we're setting this variable var1 to the special value coroutine suspended, yeah? This is the special value that indicates the function being called once the calling function to suspend, okay? So you see here, we're calling order beverage and we get back var 1000, okay? What, sorry, 10,000. Why did they use 10,000? No idea. Somebody must have said, nobody will ask for more than that, you know? So uh, what we do is we com uh, compare var 10,000 to var 4, which is coroutine suspended, yeah? And uh, if the two are equal, that means that the function we have called, order beverage, wants us to suspend. So we just return, okay? So a suspending function is a function that just returns in the normal way. But it uses a thing called a continuation. So you see at this point in the code here, um, we're going to call order food. And then if order food wants us to suspend, we'll just return. But before we do that, in a special object called the continuation, we store the beverage and we store a label. This label is the branch of the switch statement that we want to go down when we resume. That's the secret sauce, okay? So a suspending function is just a function that returns and then gets called again. But whenever it gets called again, it restores its state from the continuation object. And part of that state is a label value, and that label value sends it down a different path in the switch. So eventually, uh, when everything's done, we're going to exit all the way out. You know, we're going to exit from the switch block inside this label block here. And at that point, we'll have both our food uh, and our beverage, and we'll be able to build the breakfast. So it's all just a lie, <laughs> okay? So uh, suspending functions do not suspend. They're functions that return and get re-invoked. And the compiler implements a state machine for you using the continuation object, a switch statement, and some labels. That's all it is at the end of the day. Right, and you now have seven, seven whole minutes to teach Jetpack Compose. Can, Am I not Jet? I can slow down. You can go. <laughs> I, can, I can talk at a normal speed. Uh, okay, so uh, we've we've looked at lies told by the compiler to make our life easier. We've looked at lies told by suspending functions to um, allow us to kind of have a mental model of how asynchronous code works. Let's look at Jetpack Compose um, as a means for how do we, uh, how do lies help us kind of write uh, interesting code. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with Jetpack Compose. It went, it went version one sometime last summer. So everyone's got it in their Android app by now uh, and you're using it um, and you're happy with it um, and uh, you're kind of uh, using it for your Android apps. Uh, you may also be using Compose, Compose multi-platform, uh, which I'm not sure, but it was released just after uh, Jetpack Compose went version one uh, to build your desktop apps. Um, and I know that uh, if you're using the JetBrains toolbox, you're using uh, Compose multi-platform uh, to manage your, your JetBrains software. Um, so we've got this kind of nice uh, declarative uh, code for writing our uh, UIs. Um, and again, if we had 40 minutes, we would show you the code for this, but we've got a little application that builds us a simple calculator um, that we can explore um, how it works. So Compose is, is implemented as a DSL, so we can write nice uh, declarative nested Lambda functions for, for building up our, our applications in a, in a useful syntax. Um, it requires a compiler plugin, uh, which uh, suggests that there's some sort of um, magic happening. Um, uh, it reveals that it's not just purely an internal DSL that is doing something else. Uh, and uh, it's kind of taking steps uh, to make uh, our development experience easier. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, here is one of the buttons from our calculator. Uh, and it's an operation button, so it handles add and subtract and multiply and divide. Um, and uh, uh, what we've got here uh, is a composable function. So this is a component uh, that Compose is going to use for us. Inside our component button, uh, we um, are executing another button, uh, and that button then contains a text label. So we've got this kind of nested structure. Uh, and we annotate it with composable. Um, and note that we don't return anything. Uh, so uh, there's something happening behind the scenes because this is going to build us a UI. Uh, so we're kind of wondering, there must be some magic happening. How does it work? Uh, what uh, what does the uh, the Compose plugin do for us? 
Um, and what it does uh, is that it actually manipulates the code. This is why it's a compiler plugin um, uh, rather than uh, just a DSL. Uh, and it introduces a, a composer object uh, and an integer uh, and some other stuff uh, to allow it to emit uh, the uh, the kind of the nested uh, node-like structure uh, that we're going to build from our application. So this display text node um, has got um, loads and loads of bytecode, code, but um, we're kind of modifying it so that we've got this composable function. Um, so what it's done, uh, it has uh, converted that function uh, to take a composer uh, and a unique ID, um, and it relies on the idea that these functions are item potent, that you can call them multiple times and get the same response back, or for example, they're pure functions. Uh, so again, uh, you can cache them, and it uses the composer to generate the code that it's going to use to kind of build the UI. Uh, so these um, these composable functions emit some stuff that is then put uh, into um, this logical tree, uh, and then the logical tree is used to update the UI. The unique ID and uh, unique integer value is the thing that identifies whether um, uh, which one it is. So we could have multiple text boxes with the same values, um, but the ID that the Compose um, plugin applies um, allows us to identify the correct one. And where it puts it um, is to uh, a thing called a gap buffer or a slot table. Um, I hadn't heard of a gap buffer until I started studying uh, Jetpack and Flows. Uh, anybody heard of a gap buffer before? No computer scientists in the room? Two, two, two? up there, two. Okay. Yeah. Apparently they do it in, in school. No, they don't. That's something else. I was yeah. going to say school. Uh, but it's computer science degree. I didn't do it once. I didn't know. Um, uh, so gap buffer is a, a, a clever way to, um, to maintain um, a, a, a kind of a list of things and kind of make it easy to change stuff. Uh, and you can basically think of it as an array of slots. Um, and so the, uh, the, the function component is composed, generated, and the output is memoized or memoized, potato, potato. Uh, and put into uh, the slot uh, as appropriate. Uh, and uh, that's how um, the, uh, the Compose uh, compiler figures out uh, whether or not uh, it needs to regenerate some UI or not. So it maintains this list of groups. Uh, and then as you change your UI, as your state changes, uh, then these function arguments are going to change. Uh, and the Compose UI is able to figure out uh, whether or not it needs to change it. Uh, and if it doesn't need to change it, uh, then it doesn't. It can just skip it and use the cache version. Uh, which makes things much faster. Um, so uh, you've got a bunch of code. We've got this kind of calls to start restep, start group, and end restart group. And that allows the Compose plugin uh, to kind of say, has this ID changed? No, I'm just going to skip right over uh, and continue on and do the next bit. Uh, there's loads more detail, uh, which I'm not really skilled enough to explain. Jetpack Compose Internals is a great book, um, which goes through all the details. Um, how the compiler works, uh, and this uh, Kotlin Cobb talk from 2019 um, uh, sort of explodes a little bit more. And Leland Richardson's published some blog posts as well on Medium that you can find uh, to uh, explain those details. Very good. So I have one minute remaining for uh, conclusions, and then if you have questions, <laughs> no, uh, come find us afterwards if you have questions. Okay. So. Um, the lies are everywhere, okay? As we do our Kotlin development, we are surrounded, yeah, by, uh, by lies. And that's a good thing, yeah? Because by lying to us, the Kotlin compiler and the compiler plugins and things like the, the coroutines library and so on, they give us advanced features, yeah? They give us consistency across all the different platforms where you can do uh, Kotlin development. And they let us work at higher levels of abstraction without worrying about what's beneath, okay? And they do us the primary and most important thing Thing that anything in computer science should do, they help us as developers get home by 5 p.m., okay? So there is no higher goal, okay? So thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed that. We